third plenary session and our third theme, which is culture and participation. And I want to uh, can ask if I can David Leventhal to kick us off this morning. David is the uh, works for the uh, Mark Morris Dance Group and was the is the programme director and the founding teacher uh, of the group's programme for Parkinson's disease, which is now used as a model in I think 125 communities in 16 countries. So David, if I could ask you to come forward and address the plenary. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My sincerest thanks to the presiding officer, distinguished guests, Sir Jonathan Mills, for the invitation, and the incredible team that has organized our three days together. I know it's early, but I actually wanted to start out with a little bit of movement to get us going. So don't worry, you can stay exactly where you are. What I want us to do is actually get into the mind of a dancer. So we're gonna start out with just some basic movement and then talk a little bit about how dancers think about movement a bit differently than, uh, than regular folks. So you just take your hands to one side of your table and you can just reach them down four times to one side. It's good for us anyway. And same on the other side. Two, three, four. And the first side again, one, two, three. Very nice, everybody. Excellent. Other side. Good. Brilliant. And now, same thing, but just a little opening of your hands to either side. Opening and opening. Good. Nice long fingers. Think about all that blood you're getting circulating. Excellent. Looks great from here. I hope you can all see it. <laughs> and now reaching up as high as you can, stretching your arms, stretching out, stretching out, stretching out. All right. Good, so that's our basic movement. Now, what if I said at the beginning of that that you're imagining that you're putting your hands into water that's a little bit too hot? So there's a little bit of a retreat. Try that. So here, a little hot, and you pull it back. What if I said that instead of just opening your hands, you're actually receiving a gift from somebody? It's a gift that you've been waiting for for 40 years, and suddenly it's there and you bring it back to you. So hot water, hot water, gift, and bring it back to your heart. Hot water, hot water, gift, bring it back. Ah, that changes things. And what if we said that instead of just stretching, we we're actually in a gigantic opera house, and you're looking to the top balcony, and all of your fans are up there. And then you look at the middle balcony, and then you look at the mezzanine and the orchestra and you reach up to all of them and you bow. <laughs> and what if we try that with a little bit of rhythm and we went like this. One and two, open three, bring it back. And one and two and open, bring it back. Balcony, high and middle and a little lower and a little lower, reaching up, circle and bow, wow. You're all hired. Now, <laughs> what if we actually tried that with a little bit of music? One more time. Excellent work. So we started off with some plain old movement, a little bit of stretching, and we turned it into a dance phrase. And what if I told you at the end that this is actually from uh, a piece by the acclaimed choreographer Mark Morris, a piece called Falling Down Stairs, which was uh, commissioned as part of a project done with Yo-Yo Ma. And so you've now learned a little bit of Mark Morris choreography to start your day. A colleague and I started leading dance classes for people with Parkinson's while I was still a full-time dancer with the Mark Morris Dance Group. In between rehearsals and performances, including several tours that brought us through the Edinburgh Festival Theater, we found time to meet 
with a small group of people with Parkinson's at our dance center in Brooklyn, New York. Now, this was quite radical at the time. People with Parkinson's in a dance studio rather than a clinic, a hospital, or a nursing home. Also radical was the fact that we facilitated a real, legitimate dance class based on technique, Mark Mars repertory, like what you just learned, and creative improvisation. We emphasized aesthetics over function, imagination over mechanics, as you just did, and creative artistry over repetition. We didn't mention symptoms, and we didn't use the word therapy. We were not trying to cure anyone of anything. We simply tried to share our skills and knowledge with others who could use them, and in doing so, improve the quality of life for every individual in our class. To be honest, at the beginning, we had no idea what we were doing. But we established three guiding principles. Maybe it's better to describe them as hunches. Number one, a dance program represents a welcome antithesis to the medicalization that so often happens to people living with a chronic disease of aging. In Parkinson's in particular, slowness, rigidity, tremor, and balance issues result in people forever seeing themselves as patients. Dance class is a place where people could re-identify as dancers, as lifelong learners, as artists. This is a place where people are encouraged to ask, not what's the matter with me, but what matters to me. Two, the things that dance artists focus on in their training, the things that you all just focused on, imagery, rhythm, coordination, expressivity, balance, fluidity, social connection, these are the very things that people with Parkinson's need to address to manage their disease progression with dignity. The strategies that dancers spend their years perfecting can seamlessly and pleasurably be repurposed to help people with Parkinson's learn to move better, express themselves, and manage their lives through confidence, creativity, and skill, rather than relying on the medical system alone. Three, the sense of community created by the act of coming together to dance is as important as the actual movement that we do. By participating in the process of making art together, our Parkinson's dancers have a better chance of offsetting the isolation and depression that are so prevalent in this population. And so, the Dance for PD program has grown from eight students a month to 50 students a week in our Brooklyn studios, from one location in New York to seven, from five teachers who initially trained with us in 2007 to import the program back to their own communities, to more than 400 teachers in 16 communities, 16 countries around the world. And as it's grown, our initial hunches, those guiding principles, have become supported by cold, hard scientific evidence and warm, soft, life-affirming anecdotal narratives. We've learned a couple things. One, that people view the program as a lifeline, that they feel more confident, confident and that their self-efficacy increases, that they're able to perform at least one activity of daily living with more ease, that they integrate music and rhythm as critical tools as they move around the city, that they are more joyful and in control despite the challenges they face, that their walking improves, one participant says, when I'm in dance class, I don't have Parkinson's. Another one, quote, the music and movement started, I was filled with great joy. I was able to take the whole class and walk out feeling accomplished. I saw endless possibilities for myself. And my favorite, it's Carnegie Hall compared to Bellevue Hospital. People return week after week to experience the joys of dancing together of belonging, of feeling that they can contribute to an artistic, cultural community of people like them, regardless of their level of ability or mobility. And they are welcomed as valuable members of, first, the artistic community of the Mark Morris Dance Center, second, the network of dance for Parkinson's groups around the world, and third, the broader field of performing arts. 
Whereas other areas of their lives too often reinforce feelings of limitation and exclusion, participation in the Dance for PD program reinscribes a sense of possibility, self-worth, even hope in the face of degenerative illness. After all, Parkinson's isn't just a movement disorder, it's a quality of life disorder. And that's why dance fits Parkinson's like a glove. Dance is, of course, a physical form, but the experience of dancing also addresses the cognitive, emotional, and social issues specific to Parkinson's and the aging process. Like many diseases typically associated with aging, Parkinson's is, as filmmaker and advocate David Iverson says, a disease of subtraction. So it becomes critical to change the equation into one of addition. Dance and all of the arts are all about addition. Here's what I want you to take away today. The intimate collaboration between dance artists and people with Parkinson's, and more broadly between dance organizations and medical organizations or social service organizations, represents a robust, successful model for how all of us, all of us in the cultural sector, can leverage existing resources in our communities to address significant social and healthcare challenges. And when it's done right, at least four constituencies are served. The first, community members. It's clear that participants in our class learn strategies, think creatively, reassess their self-worth, and enter into a communal state of belonging, that vital sense of connection that Jude Kelly articulated so compellingly yesterday. But it's equally true that the program encourages dancers who often fail to understand how their skills can provide value beyond the stage to embrace the fact that what they already know, practice, and love can be of enormous life-changing benefit to members of their communities. Third, dance companies and arts presenters who traditionally focus a lot of their education work on programs for young people are waking up to the reality that there's an audience of older adults who aren't content to simply buy tickets and sit in theaters, but prefer to participate, stay active, and even perform themselves. Finally, scientists are starting to investigate the process by which dancers train, and people with Parkinson's are able to find fluidity, social connection, and rhythm through dancing. Through the Dance for Parkinson's system, scientists have a new window through which to research motor learning, motor control, and the workings of the brain. The tide is slowly starting to turn. When we started 15 years ago, doctors wouldn't give us the time of day. I love your program, but dance sounds frivolous, one neurologist actually told me. Even if it works, I couldn't possibly recommend a dance class to my patients. 15 years later, more than 70% of the students in our New York program come to us through physician referrals. Maybe it's the abundance of personal accounts or the solid research that's now being done. Maybe it's the realization that with the growing prevalence of Parkinson's, and the projection that by 2050, 22% of our global population will be over 60, that's double what it is now, we need solutions and answers that fall outside of healthcare and inside the cultural sector. And here's the most exciting thing about all of this. The human resources needed to launch life-changing dance programs for older people and people with Parkinson's, MS, and dementia They've already been created. The infrastructure, to use Professor Power's term, is already in place. Look around your community. Look around your cities. Look around your country. And you'll see dancers who are ready, willing, and able to serve, to share their expertise with members of their communities who, though they might not yet know it, are ready to come and see dance as a lifeline. Yes, dancers have to be paid, and partnerships have to be formed, and venues have to be found. But my message is not foremost about money or funding. It's about leveraging the potential of artists who are already among us, who are already here, to deliver participatory activities that help all of us, Parkinsonian or not, maintain quality of life and physical ability 
well into our later years. Dancers are here, we are ready, and we want to contribute. There's a saying in the disability community, nothing about us without us. And so in that spirit, I'm going to introduce you to Cindy Gilbertson, who will conclude this session. Thank you. I've learned to value myself more, which is quite a gift. When I'm slumping, I say to myself, I'm a dancer. I have to sit up straight. I am a dancer. And it, it gives me motivation to take better care of myself. medicine is working, I can almost do everything. It's just that the amounts of time there get shorter and shorter when it functions. Parkinson's forces you to reveal your vulnerabilities. You know, otherwise people mostly try to put on their best face, their best appearance. You know, I'm going out in public, I have to put on this and that, and I have to put my overcoat button it up tight. Well, you can't if you're going with Parkinson's and you can't button it, you're, you're revealed, you know, there's no way about it. What happens to me when my feet feel like glue and they're stuck on the floor? I sometimes cannot walk, but I can dance. If I, I can, um, I don't know, I can give you an example. Should I start? Yeah. Well, for example, Right now, I'm, I'm off. You can see my hand is shaking. I have the tremor. And if I try to walk, I have a great deal of difficulty. Um, I could walk a little bit. But if I pretend I'm dancing, I could go. And I don't have any problems. The music leads. In other words, it's not my brain telling me to take a step or to do this or do that. The music is leading me. So I'm like following this wonderful leader who's so mysterious and has such a lovely sound and it's gonna take me to some other place. What is that other place? Um, well, excuse me. It's a place where um, you're weightless, you know, you just, your body is just, um, it just flies. It doesn't tug at you, <laughs> tug you and pull you and push you and, um, you know, have you in these knots where you can't move and you can't think and you're struggling and fighting. It just, you know, you, you, you go above that. Thank you. An excerpt from a film called Capture and Grace by David Iverson. It's been a great pleasure to, and an honor to speak with you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was not just uh, uplifting, I have to say it was a great way to start a Friday morning. So, uh, I'm now going to, I'll try it on my MSP colleagues when the Parliament resumes. Um, our next speaker is Matthew Peacock from Streetwise Opera. Founded in 2002, Streetwise Opera is a charity that uses music to help people who have experienced homelessness make positive change in their lives. Matthew. 
Thank you. Um, presiding officer, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you, Jonathan, for the invitation, and thank you, David, for that beautiful presentation and your beautiful work. I'm particularly thrilled to be back in Edinburgh, where I was a student, and this place holds a very special place in my heart and always will. In the year 2000, I was a support worker in a night shelter for homeless people in London. One night after dinner, a resident read out a quote in the newspaper from a politician who said that the homeless are the people you step over coming out of the opera house. The homeless people there that night didn't just want soup and blankets, they wanted dignity and respect. They said that if they were in an opera, it would show a different side of homelessness. Together, we got hold of the opera house for two days and put on a show, and that developed into Streetwise Opera. We now run regular music activities across five regions in England, embedded both in homeless centers and in large arts institutions like Sage Gateshead and the South Bank Center. We stage operas, starring performers who've experienced homelessness and provide progression activities, volunteering and work experience in the arts for homeless people. We've expanded internationally and last month launched With One Voice, a global arts and homelessness network aiming to bring together projects of all kinds to share practice and policy. With One Voice was launched at the Cultural Olympiad in Rio where we have been working for three years with the City Council, Homeless People's Movement, arts organizations, British Council, the church, NGOs, to nurture new projects and build the first arts and homelessness sector locally. During the Cultural Olympiad, we brought delegates from all over the world to create an occupation of arts and people of the streets, a festival that homeless people themselves had designed to give visibility and dignity to Rio's street population. Back in the UK in March this year, we had our first production televised on the BBC. It was a new opera based on Bach's and Matthew Passion in co-production with the 16, one of the world's greatest choirs. It featured a newly commissioned chorus created by our performers, working with Sir James Macmillan, Scotland's most celebrated composer. Here is a short documentary to show you what happened. Crucify! This is the biggest production we have done in our 15 year history. It's ambitious on many levels. It's a piece which is musically quite challenging and we have given all of the um, main solo roles to the Streetwise performers. Rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's some um, opera. <laughs> is an abbreviated version of the very beautiful Bach St. Matthew Passion. So it's a, a, a bit shorter and it has a beautiful finale that was written especially for us by James McMillan. And it's performed by Streetwise Opera and the Sixteen, who are a wonderful early music choir. One, two, three, four. Yeah. The St. Matthew Passion Project, it's, we're all really, really excited about it. Um, tonight we've been doing the Resurrection Chorus, where we actually had a part in doing the words of it, and we had the composer James Macmillan teaching us it, so that was amazingly exciting. It's so exciting. And lightnings and thunders, and forgotten. Twelve months ago, you wouldn't have got me in here for two minutes. Now, I'm in here and you can't shut me up. It's helped me to get back to my family that I've not seen for nearly five years, and I'm going down to Liverpool this weekend to see me daughters.
Oh, you're great! <laughs> so I'm so proud. I'm so proud. <laughs> we loved it. Fantastic. I can't say much more. It was just everybody just done fantastic. It was a it's motion. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. How did you feel? Perfect. Excited. Fine. I'm gonna get married, aren't I? I'm getting married in 2017. Yeah. No, that was the perfect. That was perfect. You were yeah. perfect. <laughs>When Streetwise Opera started 15 years ago, it was immediately clear that this wasn't simply an exercise in changing public attitudes towards homelessness. It is fulfilling some significant unmet needs. Homelessness isn't just about housing. People who've experienced homelessness face many other challenges across mental and physical health. Well-being measures for homeless, the homeless population are three times lower than the national average in England. Homeless people's life expectancy is 47, and homeless people are nine times more likely to kill themselves. Homeless people always, also face chronic isolation, and even after being rehoused, often suffer from loneliness, which results in 25% going back onto the streets. So we at Streetwise and many other similar arts and homelessness organizations focus on using the arts as a tool to improve well-being and social inclusion to build people's well-being and to build a bridge for people back into mainstream society. Last year, 97% of our performers demonstrated increases in mental and physical well-being, 84% trying new activities in the community outside Streetwise, while 83% reported improved relationships with those around them. Examples like Danny in the film, re-establishing contact with his daughters, or a performer from Newcastle who was so proud of himself that he made contact with his family for the first time in over a decade, and his six-year-old granddaughter, who he had never met before, came to see him in the show. The choir member in Rio, who said that after the Cultural Olympiad, the police are treating him differently and moving him on less. The heroin addict, who said that being in Streetwise Opera had helped him look his children in the eye for the first time in 25 years. He is now a senior drug support worker. And behind these stats and stories, the reason why it is working is profound, sometimes hard to measure, but always often the most important bit of all. I believe that across society, arts gives people pride and dignity, the permission to believe in themselves, an opportunity to be defined by their achievements, not their needs, and crucially, a new identity. We all know how important it is to feel like you have an identity and a purpose. Often people's first question is, what do you do? Many Streetwise performers tell us how transformational it is to say, I'm a Streetwise opera performer. There are 60 incredible arts and homeless projects across the UK, and our first global mapping exercise through With One Voice shows around 250 arts and homeless projects worldwide. The great challenge, the great opportunity for this work is that these projects don't remain in an isolated bubble, but become mainstreamed into social welfare. In homelessness, we talk about a jigsaw of support, where the jigsaw is made up of pieces that contribute to the whole picture of support, healthcare, housing, education. The arts needs to be seen as a piece of this jigsaw of equal importance. My dream and my plea for you to take back to your countries and your work is for policymakers of different departments and homeless people to sit around the same table and look at the issue of homelessness in a holistic way, asking how can the arts contribute? It happens sometimes, but not enough. And as Michael so eloquently put it, yesterday, the arts can contribute to all sectors. And I want to say to the whole youth delegation, please on, hold on to the incredible passion we have seen, carry on being ambitious and dream big. And please remember that impossible is often only a matter of perspective. Art and creativity is part of everyone. It is not a luxury or a budget line, but a resource and a human right. We can help solve social issues, so help us work together, cross department, cross-party, 
cross-continent to help change the lives of more people for the better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. Our next speaker is Jay Wang, who is the director of the Centre on Public Diplomacy, University of Southern California, and also professor for the UCLA Annenberg School of Education of Communication and Journalism. Jay, thank you. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great honour to be here, and we are very delighted uh, to be a knowledge partner of this year's cultural summit. And on behalf of the uh, USC Center on Public Diplomacy, I would like to uh, congratulate Jonathan Mills and its foundation uh, for hosting this very timely discussion on the enduring and transformative role culture plays in society. So as an academic institution, so I'm not gonna be here dancing and singing to you, uh, but I wanted to know that this partnership is very important for us. It's important for us because it is part of our initiative to bridge the study and practice gap. The Center on Public Diplomacy was established at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles in 2003. Over the past decade, we have built a robust platform for public diplomacy scholars and practitioners from around the world through a broad portfolio of activities and programs to foster scholarship and research and to uh, provide uh, professional education and training and to help our practitioners to build capacity uh, for public diplomacy work. And we have also noticed a growing interest in the academic world in studying and researching uh, public diplomacy as we have seen uh, there is a growing representation of scholarly work in academic uh, outlets. And we are very proud as a center to play a very important role uh, to help build the field of public diplomacy into a strong and sustainable facet of international affairs. Half a century ago, distinguished American diplomat Edmund Gulline defined the term public diplomacy to specifically denote coordinated governmental efforts with foreign publics. The concept of public diplomacy obviously has since broadened and is now far more expensive. It is no longer an activity unique to sovereign states. Uh, the public dimension of diplomacy now involves a multitude of actors and networks. Uh, indeed, as a mindset and a skill set, public diplomacy is needed not only in governments, but also in businesses and civil society as we enter a phase of a far more fluid, distributed international system. Without getting into uh, this wilderness of academic definition about what public diplomacy is, let's just say that the two pillars of public diplomacy work are policy advocacy and cultural diplomacy in nation-to-nation -nation relations. Now, creating productive international relationships rests on some form of sustained understanding and some level of trust between nations and peoples. Trust is invariably a function of risk, and risk perception is heightened in times of great uncertainty. Many speakers at this summit have spoken eloquently and passionately about culture and the arts having a vital role to play, especially in these times that we feel stressed politically, economically, and environmentally. So what is the fate of cultural relations and artistic exchanges in this age of anxiety as we experience massive movement of trade, people, and ideas. Can culture really hold together, hold us together in a fracturing world? Notwithstanding its tremendous benefits over the last two decades, globalization has sharpened political and economic divides, heightening economic insecurity and cultural anxiety among many people. Of course, the movement of goods, information, and people is nothing new. What is new is the speed, scope, and scale of such movements in contemporary times. Some of us are clearly exhausted by these changes as we transit from a primarily monocultural existence to an increasingly polycentric environment. There's also not only disconnect between the elites and the general public, but also division among elites 
about the nature and the merits of trade, migration, and flow of ideas and ideologies. It is now clear that the rise of assertive nationalism and nativism, as we have seen in many parts of the world in recent times, is due in large part to the negative fallout of globalization. Now, adding to these destabilizing shifts is a crowded, fractured, and a transparent information environment. And that environment has become a part of our daily existence. Popular emotion and public opinion now exert much greater constraints on policies and state actions. The information cacophony with plain of misinformation and disinformation has exacerbated digital credulity and digital distrust. To make, to make matters worse, some of the political rhetoric and its excesses are deepening public's existential fear. As we navigate an increasingly volatile world and an international order under great stress, we should also be very clear-eyed about the inevitable limitations of human nature and human imagination. Here, I'd like to draw from the writings by the influential American theologian and social commentator in the first part of the 20th century, Reinhold Niebuhr. His thesis of moral man and immoral society, which is the title of his book, basically states that while individuals may be moral in terms of considering interests other than their own in determining their outlook and conduct, and on occasion they may even be altruistic by preferring the advantages of others to their own, these tendencies and behavior are more difficult, if not impossible, for social groups such as nation states. He argued that human groups are generally incapable of seeing and understanding the interests of others as vividly as their own. Therefore, he wrote, for all the centuries of experience, may men have not yet learned how to live together without compounding their vices and covering each other with mud and with blood. This is a rather pessimistic view of human condition. But of course, Niebuhr was not simply resigned to such pessimism. Recognizing our limitations and that there's no escape from social conflicts, he asked, what can be done to save societies from these cycles of conflicts? His answer is straightforward, to reduce them to a minimum by expanding social cooperation. Now to do that, we need to develop the incentive and the capacity for cooperative behavior, which is fundamentally about expanding the spaces of collective empathy. Now the contemporary movements of trade, people, and ideas bring tensions into our physical as well as our imagined spaces. Cultural contacts can be harmonious, mix, mixing and mingling, and they can also be contentious and sometimes even violent. After all, our tastes and sensibilities across national lines and cultural lines are varied and can be clashing. Nevertheless, these encounters should be, to quote the late journalist Christopher Hitchens, these encounters should be clashes about, not of civilizations. Cultural relations and sometimes these clashes provide the opportunity for us to open up vistas of experiences and to negotiate differences and adjust and accommodate each other's priorities. The question then becomes, does culture artistic exchange as part of the broader public diplomacy enterprise make us better communities and make us better citizens? Or is the world of cultural exchange like a swarm of busy ants carrying grains of sand back and forth without accomplishing anything truly significant? Now this is both a normative and an empirical question. In the examples, the, the beautiful presentation we just heard, music and dance embody the two most elemental form of human interaction or human communication. The use of voice, uh, the use of body. Now some view the art as the consummate communication form that helps to expand ex spaces of expression and empathy. For us at CPD, this is an empirical question. We have just started to undertake a study to better capture and understand the value of cultural exchanges to local communities in the United States. We are looking into the extent to which hosting cultural exchanges actually enhances local communities' culture, social, and civic capital, which we assume as resources are crucial for the preservation and the vibrancy of our local communities. And we approach this 
as a comparative analysis as we believe it is far more fruitful and instructive to look at the so-called relative impact as opposed to absolute ones. Given the current disruptive technologies and the nature of globalization, building new skills and capabilities are needed for organizations of cultural relations. To that end, we are developing professional education modules in storytelling and creating social stories, for instance, to help enable practitioners to expand the boundaries and to experiment and innovate their practices. I recently came across a media profile of a German chef who has achieved celebrity status in Italy as a creator and innovator of Italian national cuisine. It caught my attention when he was quoted as saying, here's a quote, one needs to understand what it means to be a foreigner in order to make a difference in the world. And I thought about this, I kind of, it does make sense, right? So there's no question that we now have more opportunities than ever to see and experience the world as a foreigner, as an outsider. At the same time, it is also true that we also are looking for relief in the face of mounting cultural anxiety as somebody being visited upon and as an insider. And we hope culture and the arts are a moderating force to help release some of these tensions, to provide us with the cultural generosity to better identify with the other. So for all that, as a pessimistic optimist, I'm convinced that there are the possibilities and prospects of public diplomacy and a cultural diplomacy as a preferred non-military means to advance peace and prosperity. And culture occupies a central role uh, in global affairs. And the challenge for us is to figure out how can we make uh, efforts and steps to ensure that uh, these cultural relations and uh, uh, artistic exchanges that are truly meaningfully delivering that kind of an impact and results at our local communities that uh, help us to expand our spaces of cooperation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, and I'd now like to call the first of our ministerial delegates, uh, the Honourable Maggie Barry ONZM. Uh, for many years, uh, Maggie was one of New Zealand's best-known radio, television uh, broadcasters, and she now serves as the Minister for the Arts, Culture and Heritage in New Zealand. I'd like to ask Maggie to come and join us at the podium. Thank you. Inga mana, inga reo, e rau rangatira maa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. In the words of New Zealand's ethnic people, the Māori people, our tangata whenua, greetings to you all, you important people from all around the world to this place. I welcome you all three times. It has been an extraordinary few days, I must say, and it is a privilege, Jonathan, and thank you uh, for putting together such a stimulating program, and one as well that really allows us to explore the options about participation and motivation. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I hold three portfolios that I think are relevant to some of the themes that we've been exploring. So, I am the Minister uh, for Seniors, although not quite yet one myself. I am the Minister for Conservation, and I am also the Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage. And to me, these three portfolios all fit a very similar theme. They are about exploring our nationhood, about who we are, New Zealanders define ourselves through our natural flora and fauna. Uh, our kiwi, our flightless birds, are unique. They are ours, and we are called kiwis, actually. Uh, that's how much we identify with this small flightless bird. I'm not sure really what that says to, about us, but we are different from other people because we tell our stories in different ways. We have our, our tangata whenua closely involved with the fabric of our society, and we, we are proudly different in the way we sing, we dance, we perform, we do our visual arts. These are the things that make us different from you all. 
And on the world stage, it is important for us to have that national identity. We are a changing society, and we have a number of uh, quirky elements that we're working on. I thought I might share a little bit of them with you. But because I'm Minister of Conservation, I pay attention to nature and to the balance of nature. And at the heart of any thriving environment is a healthy ecology. And I believe that the same applies to the arts and culture ecosystems. They too have an ecology that operates in much the same way as nature does. So for the arts sector to thrive, there needs to be a genuine interconnection and relationship between the key elements in their environments. There's a mutual dependency on the ecosystem for those various elements to survive and be healthy and functioning well. They all need each other. Help nurture one element and all the others will benefit and be stronger. Take away some vital ingredient and it might all collapse because of that interdependency. For a sustainable environment, there needs to be collaboration and strong partnerships. That isn't always necessarily found within government and within ministries, to be honest. Uh, ministries often work in silos, independently of each other, sometimes also in competition. And it takes determination and focus to encourage these bureaucratic cultures to integrate and to be more seamless and open with each other. But it is something that is essential to a healthy ecology and therefore a healthy country. Practicalities are important, of course. We have to get them right, and I'm going to use the F word here, funding. It's necessary evil. It is an important thing to take note of and address. And some of our youth representatives yesterday in a session talked about our preoccupation with numbers and uh, that that was somehow an unsavory thing. Smiling happily there, Emma, isn't it? It was a good point, and it's one that we, we need to think about. We can't lose sight of of the heart and soul of what we're doing. But unless we have the numbers, and, and we don't, if we don't get them right, it's at our peril, and all else will falter. So it is important to use leverage, another word I've heard quite a few times at this summit, uh, maximizing the Crown funding, making the taxpayers' dollars go further, uh, and to be matched so that we have public-private partnerships and we are open to those. These are the things that we need to be imaginative and creative about, and we have to get those fundamentals right. For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of visiting us in Aotearoa, New Zealanders, or Kiwis as we called ourselves, are very justifiably uh, proud of our native and indigenous cultures. Uh, you may be familiar with them with kapahaka, the warlike dance that happens before the All Black Games, or you might have seen the Edinburgh Tattoo, uh, which has had uh, Maori culture groups performing. Uh, there's a similarity in energy and, and passion uh, with those groups. It is very important to us, but we are a changing society, and it's happening quite rapidly, more rapidly than some people are ready for. With 39% of its pop population born overseas, our largest city, Auckland, is now more ethnically diverse than Sydney, Los Angeles, London, or even New York. Auckland has over 200 ethnicities, speaking over 160 languages. So engaging people with accessible arts, culture, history, and heritage, helps create strong and resilient communities and knits together all of those different cultures in a way that's meaningful to the people who live there. One very clear example is the role that cultural participation continues to play in the recovery from the earthquakes that devastated Christchurch. They started in 2010, they continue on to this day. We're known as the Shaky Isles, and we feel a particular sadness and affinity with the tragic events of Italy this week. But in Christchurch, when the first earthquakes occurred, once people's basic needs were met, they told us what they most wanted were places to meet, either face-to-face -face or online, to share their stories and to experience events and activities that would lift their spirits, whether that was perhaps to dance on a makeshift dance mat or access a, an open-air pavilion for music and films, or even a temporary bowling green on an abandoned building site. People needed to get together. They needed the arts and the culture to nurture them in, in, in a place that was important to them, that needed to heal, and the arts were a huge part of that. We found that though, for some time after the earthquakes, people were very reluctant to go into the traditional venues, theatres, cinemas, so the Christchurch arts sector took it to the streets.
and they had pop-up theater, outdoor activities and events in public space, spaces that were far more inclusive than they used to be traditionally, and it worked terrifically well. We must never lose sight of the fact that the arts are a powerful source of strength and fulfillment. A survey by our arts organization, Creative New Zealand, found 88% of participants agreed that the arts are good for you, but not perhaps in the way that spinach and broccoli are good for you. A society that speaks and thinks imaginatively and creatively is a society that can be innovative and adaptable, adaptable socially, environmentally, and economically. So let's accept, and in this audience I'd be surprised if anyone argued, that arts and culture are vehicles for progress. They create vibrant towns and cities, draw cards for businesses and for tourists, jobs are created, diplomatic and trade relationships. In New Zealand, for the first time last year, tourism overtook dairying as our greatest earner, and that's a phenomenal shift. A lot of people came to New Zealand to see our landscapes and to see our, our culture and find out what was different about us. Nearly three quarters, actually, of international visitors say that they come to New Zealand to experience our natural environment. So we've developed a program to get people out into the outdoors and to explore New Zealand's national parks, our coastlines, our inner city green spaces. We've called it Healthy Nature, Healthy People, and it actively encourages people to go out onto the conservation estates and enjoy the physical and the mental health benefits of contact with nature. Some of our partners include the Mental Health Foundation and the Ministry for Health. Researchers estimated a health saving for every kilometer walked, $2.70 is saved from the health budget, and $1.30 for every kilometer cycled. It's quite good to be able to measure the numbers sometimes and get that tangible evidence so that we can prize money out of our wealthier ministries. And health is right in behind us. I'm sure if we put a value on participation in the arts and culture, it would be as significant. Access is important, but it also comes with its challenges. One in five New Zealanders has a disability, and Access Aotearoa facilitates arts for all, which are networks around the country to help ensure that access is not left to chance. These networks encourage and incentivize performing arts companies, galleries, museums, and all venues to include sign-interpreted performances and tours, as well as audio descriptions for people who are blind or partially sighted, and workshops and relaxed performances for people with intellectual disabilities. An example is a bilingual show for deaf and hearing audiences at the end of my hands, and that plays to sell out audience, and it bridges the gap between people who are normal and people who have disabilities, and makes, uh, makes them the same in a way that is meaningful. As the Minister for Seniors, my focus is on ensuring that New Zealanders with our ageing population continue to be healthy and active and connected as they age. Often ageing is seen as somehow as a cost to society. My ambition is to challenge that attitude. We will all live longer, and at home, our over 65 population will double within 25, within the next two years, uh, 20 years, sorry, and dementia rates uh, will treble. And, and those are problems that we need to be able to plan for if we're going to deal with the challenges properly. Because we don't want to just live longer. We want to lead meaningful lives, and we want to be able to enjoy ourselves. And I loved uh, David Leventhal and the, the Mark Morris dance for PD. A tremendous, a wonderful thing. I don't know if you know what we have at home, the hip hop operation. Uh, we have a group of dance performers uh, who are all in their 80s. In fact, some are in their 90s. Half a dozen of them have dementia. Most of them need medication, Zimmer frames, uh, quite a lot of assistance, actually, to live their daily lives. But as we saw with your example, David, when people uh, put aside their pains and aches and get to the music and to the rhythm of what they're doing, uh, they really thrive and achieve things that they didn't think that they were capable of. And because it's done to hip-hop, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, people in their 90s who actually have green hair and chains and bling and a bad boy attitude, actually, uh, and they stand up there and they shake their booty, and they do tremendously well. I, um, I probably should have broken the rules, Jonathan, and brought a clip along with me. Uh, any event I have ever been to with the hip-hop operation troops, uh, it brings the house down. They are remarkable people, and they remember, actually, even through the dementia, the music touches them in a way that makes them move and makes them 
are no longer in that state where they can't remember their past and their future. And they do what is the most valuable thing of all and what we all should do, which is to live in the moment. So combining dance and resonating with people's shared memories is something that works very well. And our hip hop operation people actually did very well in Las Vegas with the, the, uh, those people doing hip hop. They were awarded and uh, had worldwide acclaim and they love every moment of that. I could talk for a long time about these things, but I know that there are others. But I would say this, and, and with the opera too, I acknowledge that. And I think with homeless people and any self-esteem issues and elements of being on the outside, to bring people in and to incorporate them as part of society in a way that involves culture and music and art is the most powerful way to do it, I believe. We have a saying in New Zealand, Aotearoa, we are the land of the long white cloud. What is the most important thing? It is he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. The people, the people, the people. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Maggie Barry. We will now hear from Mr. Azad Duzuman Noor from Bangladesh. And Mr. Noor is an actor, a writer, a director who's been involved in uh, hundreds of stage, radio and television and film productions over many years and is now the Minister for Culture for Bangladesh. Mr. Noor, thank you. Thank you very much. The Honourable Presiding Officer, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, a very good morning to you. Bangladesh and its culture has always been defined by its power to ensure participation. And it is through the people's participation that our culture has endured. The culture of our fertile lands has evolved through the ages, and our folk music, village theater, terracotta art, and many more are testament to the richness of our heritage. None of this would be possible without the participation of, of the everyday people of Bengal. It is not only the local artisans, musicians, and theatre troops who make our culture endure, but the grandmothers who tell our folk tales, the boatmen who sing songs of the river, and the bowls who travel across the countryside and sing about the love for all creatures. All of these countless contributors come together to make the culture of Bangladesh what it is today. In more recent years, the huge crowds who gather at our music festivals, book fairs, and New Year celebrations only work as an example of the mass participation in our cultural activities. In turn, it is their participation that ensures the diversity and durability of our culture. Long ago, I was a regular performer in one of the pioneering theatre groups in the revival of Bangladeshi theatre in the early years of our independence in 1971. Our group staged translated versions of Bartle Brecht's plays, among others, which had strong social and political messages. The plays became immensely popular in Bangladesh with massive audience support. The use of storytelling techniques and songs and direct address to the audience energized them. The socialist messages resonated with the audience's expectations of social, economic, and political change, and we drew immense satisfaction from interacting with them. Theatre in Bangladesh is a prime example of the important relationship between culture and participation. Bangladesh has experimented with different varieties of theatre, from folk to absurd, classical to poor. We, of course, have our own traditional theatre forms that predates the arrival of European proscenium theatre in the late 18th century by a thousand years, such as Jatra, Pala, Gombira, Akrai, etc. All of this continue to be an important part of our local folk culture and depends on a close involvement of the audience of their effectiveness. Theatre has also been used by non-government organisations to spread their messages on development issues including education, health and nutrition, and women's empowerment. Similarly, folk music in Bangladesh is also hugely influenced 
by audience participation and interaction with the musicians and often draw an important social and cultural issues for inspiration. Nokshi Kantha, a traditional craft of stitching blankets, is also wholly dependent on participation, since it is traditionally meant to be the stories of the lives of rural women woven into the material through the artisan's workmanship. Bangladesh also has a thriving arts industry and many up and coming new artists are not only experimenting with the different styles and inspiring important commentary on various social issues, they are also interacting with the art viewers through their work and making audience participation an important focus of their art. In recent times, participation has again been in focus as newer demands for education and entertainment began to be felt in the wake of emergent problems and conflicts such as an insidious drug culture and religious extremism. The spread of culture, both of which primarily targets the youth, particularly in the case of religious extremism, the spread of culture is considered by many educators and psychologists as a potent antidote. All over Bangladesh, children and youth are being encouraged to engage in cultural activities with persuasive messages about the dangers of extremist beliefs. Physical disabilities and differently challenging situations such as autism have also been the focus of many new generation works of art. Besides, many social health and other messages are now seen to be more effective if given to children from their early education days and culture is felt to be a means of achieving these ends. Educators have also started to involve marginalized children in cultural activities, such as through street children, theater groups, and bring their daily struggles to a wider audience. At the Edinburgh International Cultural Summit 2014, the dynamic discussion on the three themes, values and measurements, cities and culture, and advocacy and identity contributed towards the idea of creating a safe platform through culture towards building a more open, inclusive, and stable society in Bangladesh. Following the discussion at the last summit, the Bangladeshi Cultural Minister, Ministry partnered with the British Council in a pioneering project, a different Romeo and Juliet, performed by Bangladeshi people with disability. This groundbreaking theater project, which commemorated the 400 years of Shakespeare's death, was first of its kind in Bangladesh and has opened a new horizon for policymakers and emerging cultural leaders to use arts as a medium to create an inclusive society. This unique project also showed the power of culture in the opening dialogue and debate amongst people. Through this work, we have learned the crucial role that culture can play in spreading messages of inclus inclusivity through a wider society and has raised awareness of a bigger challenge in creating accessibility at public and private establishments. Now that Bangladesh has produced a successful example, it is time to mainstream such initiatives to create a sustainable platform for a democratic and pluralistic society. This year's theme for the summit, which is culture building resilient communities, is also very timely in interpreting the vital role of the culture plays in the life of any successful community. The Ministry of Cultural Affairs is now working with British Council in a project aimed to, transport, aimed to transform public libraries across Bangladesh to create community-led cultural spaces. However, while I can strongly claim that mass cultural participation still exists in Bangladesh and that culture is a crucial medium for ensuring an inclusive and pluralistic society, we cannot deny the disconnect between cultural education and the wider education system of Bangladesh. As more and more students are pressurized to achieve top grades and get into good universities, cultural activities are beginning to take a back seat in their priorities. The constant cycle of school and extra lesson that students are forced to endure leaves them drained at the end of the day and gives them very little room 
to engage in cultural activities. In fact, forcing these students to study and in many cases memorize only textbooks can have negative psychological impacts, thus making them even more susceptible to developing antisocial tendencies and being exploited for radicalization. We must act at once to stop this constant pressure and wrote memorization to pass standardized tests and instead, and instead acknowledge the diversity of the needs and the important role of culture in ensuring a holistic education. The influence of culture can also play a crucial role in combating terrorism, not just in Bangladesh, but all over the world by spreading the ideals of pluralism, secularism, and tolerance. Our focus should not be on creating a mass of A-plus students, but progressive and open-minded citizens of the future. It is only by focusing on culture and ensuring participation and diversity at all levels of society through well-rounded education systems, ministry activities at local, regional, and national levels, partnering with local and international cultural organizations, and sound cultural policy that we can move towards creating a progressive and enlightened global society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Noor. Now, after uh, Michael Gowan's uh, welcome contribution yesterday, we're going to end this morning's session with a presentation from three of our young delegates, Blair Boyle, Emma Roos, and Daniel McCormick uh, from Youth Arts Voice. I'd ask Blair, Daniel, and Emma to join us now. Thank you very much. Presiding officer, ministers, ambassadors, honours guests and ladies and gentlemen, I would first of all like to thank every single person here for this incredibly inspiring and motivating, incredible three days that I am sure I will personally treasure for many years to come. It has been thought-provoking and exciting, so thank you to Jonathan. Um, for inviting us and allowing us to be here. And thank you to Faye, the director of the GIF uh, Programme Summit for making us incredible. And thank you to everyone here. So, what is GIF Arts Vo Voice Scotland? Who are we and what do we do? So we are a group of young people. When we were established in 2014, we were established as a national GIF Arts advisory group. Um, for Scotland's first and only national youth arts strategy um, called Time to Shine. Um, Time to Shine is unique in, in its policy that it places young people at the heart of your decision-making process, not only locally, regionally, but also nationally at strategic policy level. Um, we work closely with Young Scott, Creative Scotland, and with the Scottish Government themselves. So... Um, who are we? So we are, as I said, when we established, we were a group of about 15 young people aged from 14 to 22, um, ranging from the Western Isles right down to the borders, um, so transcending geographical location. And we have three key themes that are actually replicated in the, the strategy itself, which is participation, um, provision, and progression. And the vision of the Time to Shine strategy is that in 10 years, well, eight years' time from now, when we started, it was 10 years' time, Scotland would be an, a world leader in GIF arts, creativity, and innovation. Um, GIF Arts Voice Scotland also has a vision. Um, get all young people in Scotland, regardless of who they are, where you're from, your background, economic situation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will have equal, both equal access and opportunity to art and cultural activities. So, I am now going to pass you over to my peer, Emma, who's going to talk about some of the more concrete, tangible work that we have done. But again, I would like to thank you all.
One of the first things we set up when we started in 2014 was the Nurturing Talent Fund. The Nurturing Talent Fund is a fund for young people aged 14 to 20 to create their own projects, and it was entirely created and led by us with assistance from Creative Scotland. We sit on the board to assess the applications, and we have given out thousands upon thousands of pounds to young people to create their own projects and have their dreams realized, to be honest. They do things such as rent out gallery spaces and create EPs, and honestly, it's really inspiring to see all the work that's going on in Scotland. The, through Time to Shine, we've created, with Creative Scotland, there are nine youth arts hubs all across Scotland, from the Highlands to locations such as central Edinburgh. And through the youth arts hubs and all the Time to Shine projects, there have been over 40,000 participants, which I'm sure everyone here will agree is an amazing number. But as some of you will know, if you were in the session I was in yesterday afternoon, I don't believe that numbers are everything. <laughs> I don't think we can measure the full impact of Time to Shine. I don't think we can put a tangible number on how much this strategy has done for the young people of Scotland. Not everyone will know its name, not everyone will have Googled what is this time to shine that I'm hearing about, but they will have been affected by it in the smallest ways, from using the print studio at Out of the Blue, which is Edinburgh's arts hub, to just walking past posters in the street and thinking, oh, that looks cool, they're still engaging. And it's an amazing thing to be able to engage so many young people. But I believe I'm preaching to the choir here because everyone in this room believes in the importance of arts and the importance of culture. But I'm going to ask a question. Do we all agree on the importance of young people? Having seen the response to the youth delegation here today and here for this summit, I would say that we're definitely making headway there. I look at the people sitting to your left and I see some of the most amazing people, some of the most passionate, intelligent people. And I, I may be a tad biased uh, thinking of how amazing they are, but they are the future. And in two years, 10 years, I think some of these people will be sitting where you all are now and making these important decisions. So I'm really honestly grateful that we've all been invited here to show you what the youth of Scotland can do personally and what the youth of every country can do. So I would invite you after the summit to connect with your young people because I think through Time to Shine and Youth Arts Voice Scotland, we at least, with the help of the summit, have shown what Scotland's young people can do and it's the same all across the world. I will now pass you over to my colleague Blair to talk to you a little bit more about Time to Shine. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all. And through the past two years, we have experienced the absolute incredible passion of young people. Um, if you don't currently work with young people, go and do it because it will change your life and the way that you work. Um, so two years in, we are approaching our first biennial conference, the Time to Shine on Convention. So that's going to be a thing where we showcase and celebrate the work that the young people, um, not us and not Creative Scotland or Young Scott, but the young people who have actually been involved on a participating level have done over the past year. The young people who have put their hearts uh, into every action and have put their passion into what they do. Um, so I, and I'm sure we, can't wait for that because it's showing off, basically, and they've done so much, and it's going to be good to show off what they've done. Um, so we've also gone through the process recently of evaluating the implementation of Time to Shine. So it's evaluating its effectiveness two years into a 10-year strategy. Um, so we've got eight years to go. We're just getting started, and we've got so much to do, but we're getting there. Um, so many things have become clear in this evaluation, uh, one of which relates to participation and, ironically, numbers. <laughs> um, but I'd like to refer to Maggie, you said it earlier, I believe, from New Zealand. Numbers are important, obviously, for what you do, um, but I think the way in which they're important can be changed. Um, 
In order to measure it, we often slap a number on it. Um, so it would be one, one, one. Um, and that's measuring the width, not the depth. And in order to measure our true potential and our true value, we need to get away from that. Um, when we measure by width, not depth, we reduce human beings to just one and we lose our true value. Um, we need to recognize depth, not width. Um, when we show width, we have nothing to gain. All we have and all we aim for is more people and more young people being involved. When we measure depth, we have something and everything to play for um, because we aim to go deeper and improve in what we already have. Um, and for me, that's so much more important, getting a quality rather than a quantity. Um, so that's one of the things that we've learned through doing our current evaluation, and that's what I want to share with you. Um, but finally, I'd like to finish up um, just by referring back to Matthew from this morning. I believe you said um, the opportunity to be defined by our achievements, not our needs. And I think young people, all of us, we have so much potential and we're defined by what we can do in everything. And I'd love to share that with you and just take advantage of that because we're here and we're going to be where you are in 10, 15 years. So why not use us just now and improve on that? Um, so we here in this room, we have the opportunity to change lives. And as a young person, I would like to encourage you that before you change lives, be willing to change your minds and let us change your minds. Thank you. Dear Emma and Blair, thank you very much. Thanks for that contribution, and thank you to all our speakers this morning for the contribution. We're now going to uh, close this plenary session and go into our discussion groups. And I'll hand over to Vicky Houston to take charge again. Thank you.